Morning. Morning. It's good to see everybody today. We're encouraged by the presence of each one of you. As mentioned earlier, if you are visiting with us today, we want to extend a special welcome to you and invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street anytime that you may have the opportunity to do so. I want you to picture in your mind's eye who you would say is the greatest man that you've ever known. It may be your father. It may be your grandfather. It may be your husband. It may be an elder or a Bible class teacher or a preacher that had a great influence upon you. It may be a friend. It may be some other acquaintance that you have. But for one reason or another, the image of that person's face that is flashing through your mind at this time has led you to believe that they are a great person. They had certain qualities about them that led you to believe that they were great. When we go back through secular history, we find a number of people who were known as great we think about some of the rulers of the past, a man by the name of Darius the Great of Persia. You may recognize the name Darius from the book of Daniel in the fact that Darius was the one that had Daniel cast into the lion's den. Well, at the height of Darius's popularity, his empire was larger than the entire continent of Europe. And he has come to be known in history as Darius the Great. Later on, there was a Greek conqueror and monarch who conquered much of the world at that time in uh, Europe and Asia Minor. And we remember him as Alexander the Great. There was a king who lived in Lydia whose name was Croesus the Great. He had that name because of the great wealth and opulence that he lived around. There were great philosophers who are remembered for their teachings, men such as Socrates, men such as Confucius and Plato and people like that who are remembered for their greatness. But we must remember that the scriptures tell us very plainly in Luke 16 and verse 15 that what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. In the Bible, there are certain men that we find who are referred to as great. Abraham was referred to as great in Genesis 24 and verse 35. Moses was referred to as great in Exodus 11 and verse 3. But without question, and I don't believe that there is anyone here today that will deny the statement that I'm about to make, the greatest man that ever lived was Jesus Christ. He came to this earth, he took on flesh, he lived a perfect life. But Jesus himself says that there was another man. A man who for the purpose of our lesson this morning we will refer to in this way. The second greatest man who ever lived. I want you to look again at our scripture reading this morning that Brother Jadon shared with us just a few moments ago. And remember, Jesus himself is the one that is speaking here. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, now notice this, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. We need to go back to the first century. We need to go back to the time that Jesus uttered these words. The ministry of John is about to come to an end. 
John is in prison at this time and reports begin, uh, begin coming to him about Jesus. And so he sends some of his disciples out to ask Jesus some questions. Well, after these disciples leave, some of those that are still there with Jesus, they want to know about this man. They want to know about John and who he is in retrospect to Christ. And so Christ asks a series of questions. And he tells them, what did you, what did you go out to see? What, what kind of person led you out there? What were the traits that you heard about him that motivated you to leave the city, to go out into the wilderness to find this man? What were the qualities of greatness that led you to John? And first he acknowledges that John was more than a prophet. You know, these very people that he was talking to here, many of them had been Jews. They were familiar with the prophets. And they knew that in times past, prophets had come and they had been rejected. Many of them had been put to death. But here was a man that many people liked what he had to say. They were going out and he was leading many people to repentance. So what was different about John? What was it about this man that led Jesus to make the statement, that of those born of women, and what he means by that, those who were conceived naturally, this removes Jesus from the equation. Those who were born of women, those who were of a completely natural birth, he said there's never been one born greater than John the Baptist. So what he's saying is that at that time, in the first century, no one had been born that could measure up to the greatness of John the Baptist. Now keep that in mind as we go through the lesson this morning because we're going to look at a couple of other things at the end of this lesson that's going to bring this full circle. So what are some of the traits of John that made this individual so great? Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning of John. We find that his birth announcement was one that was amazing. We read in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, where the angel Gabriel appears to the father of John the Baptist, a man by the name of Zacharias. And he says, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Notice a statement that's made in this passage. Notice that he says that John would be great in the eyes of the Lord. Now you remember just a few minutes ago when I was talking about all of these people from secular history that we remember as being great. Their desire was greatness in the eyes of man. We continue to see many people in the world around us today. There may even be some of us here today at least to various degrees that we're striving to appear great in the eyes of man. But folks, that's not what's important. What's important is that we appear great in the eyes of God. When God looks at us, he sees a great man, a great woman, a great husband, a great wife, a great mother or father, a great servant of his. When God looked at John the Baptist, when Jesus look at, looked at John the Baptist, he saw someone who was spiritually great. No, he did not have any of the marks of physical greatness. He was not one that had any sign of significance, any sign of royalty. He was not even performing his ministry in a public place. He was out in the wilderness. And people were still drawn to him, drawn to the message that he was proclaiming. And the reason that was was because he was filled with the Holy Spirit from the time that he was in his mother's womb. This 
is one of the qualities that led John to being great. This motivation of the Holy Spirit. Now, something that we need to look at from this, John 10 and verse 41 tells us that John performed no signs, performed no miracles. And typically, whenever we read of those in the New Testament that are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's talking about those miraculous spiritual gifts that many of them had in the early days of the church. But John didn't have any of those things. So what does it mean when it says that John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb? Folks, what it means is that the Holy Spirit was giving him the knowledge, the wisdom, and the ability to proclaim a certain message to a certain people. The Holy Spirit was who was revealing to John the things that he needed to say to prepare the hearts of the Jews for the coming of Jesus. This was not something that he was taught. This was not something that he had been trained in by another individual. But the Holy Spirit was the one that was leading him to say these things and to do the things that he was doing. And this is one of the things that led to the greatness of John. Now when we think about ourselves today and we think about the task that we have before us, it's not quite as spectacular as the task that John was fulfilling. John was there to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. But yet, we too have the promise of the Holy Spirit today. Peter on the day of Pentecost, when they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You remember what he said in Acts chapter 2? He said in verse 38, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And what? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We still have the Holy Spirit influencing us today. No, the Holy Spirit does not influence us or fill us in the same way that the Holy Spirit filled John. No, the Holy Spirit is not influencing us in the same way that the Holy Spirit influenced the apostles or even those other inspired individuals that we read of in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit continues to fill us and influence us today when we allow the Word of God to come into our hearts and to transform us. That is the influence of the Spirit. But through the Holy Spirit, John would turn the hearts of many of the Jews to the Lord. Now I want you to stop and think for just a moment. What greater accomplishment could anyone attain in this life than to lead someone else to Christ? I can't think of one. You know, we think about certain individuals from the past that we remember who were very influential in leading thousands of souls to Christ. In fact, one passed away this last week with Brother Jimmy Allen. We think about people who, through their, uh, through their influence... And through the abilities that God blessed them with, their abilities of communication, that they use the Word of God to lead many people to Christ. These are certain marks of greatness that we apply to those individuals. Well, John, he led the hearts of many of the Jews to Christ, preparing the way for the kingdom to come. But also, John was great because he was humble. One of the struggles that great men and women often have is that of arrogance. Oftentimes when people realize that people are looking up to you, that you are a leader of others, or that you have achieved a certain degree of success or wealth, you suddenly begin to think more highly of yourself than you ought. But we don't see that with John. Throughout the ministry of John, even though all these people were coming out to him, he maintained his humility. He made the statement in Matthew 3 and verse 11. He said, I indeed baptize with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. And then you remember on the occasion that Jesus came to the Jordan there to be baptized of John, 
John really didn't want to do it. John felt like that it should be reversed. He felt that Jesus is the one that should be baptizing him. John asked him the question very plainly. He says, I need to be baptized of you, but you're coming to me? Why, why are you coming to me? We see the humility there. He was keeping himself in check in the position that he was supposed to hold. But then we find on another occasion, John made the statement in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 26, he says, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John was willing to step aside when he realized that his ministry had been fulfilled. He understood the, the parameters of what he was supposed to be engaged in. And when he realized that Jesus was now beginning his earthly ministry when people were beginning to go to him, when people were being baptized at the teachings of Jesus. He said, this is what was supposed to happen all along. He said, I'm supposed to just kind of fade into the sunset. He said, I was here, I prepared the way, but now Jesus is here. He's the one that you need to follow. He maintained that humility. And this was one of the marks of greatness of John. But John also was great in the fact that he was not afraid to stand up to those who were powerful when it came to denouncing sin. In Matthew 3 verses 5 through 8, it says that Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, when he saw the religious leaders, those who were the religious elite, those who were leading and guiding people in the practice of the Jewish faith, when he saw those individuals coming to him, he called out to him. He said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. He says, you have to change. He says, if you want to be prepared for the kingdom to come, then you have to bear fruit that's worthy of repentance. You know, it's one thing to say that we want to be a child of God but it's another thing entirely to do what's necessary to become a child of God just because a person is baptized it does not mean that they've reached the point that they are actually a child of God because there are steps that come before that that have to be fulfilled and one of those is repentance if we've not turned away from our past life if we, like John says here, if we are not bearing fruit worthy of repentance, then all we're doing is getting wet. We're not being added to the kingdom. We're not having our sins washed away. And that's what he's telling these religious leaders. He says, you're not ready for this. You've not changed your life. He says, you go and you do what these other people are doing. You listen to the things that I'm teaching. You make these changes. Bear that fruit that's worthy of repentance. But not only this, we find that John was even willing to stand up to the king and we remember that ultimately it led to his death. The king had gone out and had stolen away his brother's wife. He had taken for his wife his sister-in-law. John told him very plainly, this is not right. It's not lawful. It's not scriptural for you to be married to her. Well, she got her feelings hurt. She was offended. She developed a grudge against John. But Herod, 
he was afraid of John. He could tell that John was a great man, a holy man. And he didn't really want to stir things up. But the time came when Herod's birthday rolled around. He threw a great feast. And during this feast, Herodias' daughter comes in, puts on some type of a show, comes in and dances and entertains the crowd. And it pleases Herod so much. He said, I will give you anything that you want up to half of my kingdom. Anything you want. So she runs to her mother. Says, hey, this is what Herod's saying that he's going to give to me. What do I need to ask for without hesitation? She said, I want the head of John the Baptist. So she goes back. She tells Herod what she wants. Well, Herod, here he is. He's around all of his diplomats, all of these uh, government leaders of the day. And he does not want to lose his influence, so he gives charge to the prison. He has John the Baptist beheaded, has his head presented to his stepdaughter. John lost his life because he was willing to stand up for the truth. Because he would not back down regardless of how powerful and how influential the person was that he had to stand up to. Even though it meant that he was putting his life at risk and ultimately lost his life. He was going to put the will of God first. This is a mark of greatness with John the Baptist. Now, these passages that I've shared with you this far or thus far... They serve to show why Jesus referred to John in the way that he did. But we have to keep this in the context of the time. At the time that Jesus spoke these words, no one greater than John the Baptist had ever been born. John was a truly great man. And at the time that Jesus uttered these words... We could truly say that John was the second greatest man who ever lived. But I want you to look at the second part of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But look at this. But he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. By saying this, Jesus was not downplaying the greatness of John at all. But what he is showing us in this statement is that the kingdom of God is greater than than the law of Moses. Being a part of God's kingdom, being able to be a child of God is a greater blessing than anything that John ever received. John had preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom had not come into establishment yet and John was arrested and lost his life before the kingdom ever came into establishment. But now, when we think about the least in the kingdom of heaven, this is talking about children of God, those who are Christians. He says the least in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John the Baptist. Now think about this for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 13... Verses 16 and 17, we find these words. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Folks, what that means is that we have the privilege today 
of seeing things and hearing things. What this means is we have the ability to understand things that those who lived in previous dispensations of time were not privy to. We have the ability to know things that John the Baptist was not allowed to know. We have the ability and we have the privilege to enjoy certain blessings that John was not allowed to have. I want you to think for just a moment. We have an insight into salvation. What was the message of John the Baptist? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was not until after John had died that Jesus first proclaimed that he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. John didn't have that knowledge. John did not have the privilege of proclaiming the gospel. He simply taught people what they needed to do for the coming of the kingdom. To be ready to accept the gospel message. But we today, we have the ability, we have the privilege, let's put it that way. We have the privilege of being able to declare the whole counsel of God. To be able to carry the gospel out into this world and tell people what they need to do in order to make it to heaven. John couldn't do that. All John could do was tell them someone is about to come and I am preparing you to accept that person. Therefore, you need to get the sin out of your life and be ready. Be as ready as you can be to enter into the kingdom. But folks, we have the ability to go out and set the door to the kingdom right in front of each and every person. We have the ability to go out and just as Peter did on Pentecost, we have the ability to tell people, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. We have the ability to go out and tell people as Jesus did, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That is a truly great honor, a great privilege that we have. And so in bringing this lesson full circle, the second greatest man who ever lived at the time of the old law was John the Baptist. But the second greatest person who ever lived is now a faithful Christian. I want you to think about those things this morning. And as we sing our invitation song today, I want you to reflect upon your spiritual life. And I want you to ask yourself this question. When God looks at you today, does he see someone who is spiritually great? Oh yes, we can look at the example of John. Yes, we need to have the same marks of greatness that John had. But also are we taking advantage of those other great things that Jesus has made available to us as children of God? Are we living that faithful Christian life? If not, then I encourage you this morning to make your life right while you have this opportunity. If you are a child of God but you've strayed away from the faith and you're no longer living that faithful Christian life, then repent of your sins and come forward and be restored this morning. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, then follow those steps that I shared with you this morning. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then do what he said. Repent of your sins. Turn away from those things. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized. Have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism. The Lord will add you to the church today. You can begin living that faithful Christian life. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while together we stand and sing.